Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. My name is Linda Paul, and I'm Senior Manager of Healthy Development at the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm one of the partners who work, works on the uh, National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Child, Youth, and Family Mental Health. Um, you are here today at the session titled Trauma-Informed Care and the Pyramid Model, Promoting Opportunities to Heal. Um, and I know this is going to be a great session. I want to just quickly go over a few things with you. Um, first of all, we'd like to remind everyone of our commitment to maintaining um, a safe and accountable space. If you experience any issues and need assistance, please reach out to me and I will um, connect you um, to um, assistance. Um, and you can direct message me um, using some of the, the feature um, on, on this platform. Um, to walk you through the tools in this session, I want to let you know about the brand, um, toolbar. Um, if you can't see the toolbar, it means that you probably have the event feed um, suggest that you close this. Um, once you close, close the event feed, you will see the toolbar and you will see uh, different icons that represent um, different um, services or, or ways to um, communicate. So there's the chat function. Um, and I would recommend that, um, that we try and refrain from the chat function if at all possible, as it can be a little distracting, but we want you to use the question and answer. So if you have question and answers throughout the presentation, please put them there. I will be watching um, and helping to assist that. Um, in addition, um, if you need to take a break and step away or deep, deep um, decompress a little, please feel free to do so. Um, there are wellness rooms open to you um, and you can enter the wellness room by uh, clicking on the wellness room button um, at the top left of the event navigation page. Um, a member of our team will be there to meet with you. So now without further ado, we're going to go into our uh, session for today. i first like to introduce the speakers briefly. Lisa Knight, is a mom, advocate, doctoral candidate, and has lived experience with challenging behavior, preschool expulsions, and the pyramid model. For the past 18 years, her work um, has included providing training and technical assistance on the pyramid model, previously managing the disabilities and mental health service area and Head Start and Early Head Start and serving families with Part C early steps and working in local school districts as a licensed speech and language pathologist. Julia Sales um, has, is our other presenter and she has spent the last decade serving early childhood populations through direct clinical work with children and families, training and technical assistance of early childhood educators um, and creating professional development materials. Julie has worked as a mental health consultant for Head Start programs throughout Boston. Julia is a faculty member at Georgetown University where her work centers around infant, early, infant and early childhood mental health. And I very much look forward to the presentations. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to them. So take it away, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda, and welcome into the room, everyone. Linda, we sound so fancy. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I am Lisa and just so excited to see everybody in the room. We got folks from all over the country joining us, and I'm just excited to share space and also share this platform with my dear colleague and friend, Julia. So, hey, hey, everybody. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I think we are just excited to be really thinking about 
grounding ourselves down in those early, early years. So often we are able to look back and say, wow, like let's think about where things actually started. And so often they start when kids are really young. And sometimes we're not thinking about really young kids as we think about our systems of care. And so Lisa and I are here to really represent infant and early childhood as an amazing place to start for promotion and prevention, but also a place for intervention. If we need to intervene early, let's do it when the brain is ready for it and we know we can make a huge bang for our buck. Um, and so we're so excited that there's so many people willing to join us in this space today. Absolutely. All right. So today we will be talking about trauma, but primarily trauma-informed care practices for infant and young children. We will be taking some time to unpack the pyramid model. So hopefully some folks are familiar with it. And if not, that's okay too. And then we're going to look at some strategies to become more trauma attuned in the work that we do in early child care. Next. All right, so before we go any further, because we are talking about trauma, we do recognize that some things may come up for you, and that's okay if it does, but we want you really to take time for yourself. If you have to just uh, take a break, walk away, do some tapping, but we just want you to pay attention to how you're feeling, what's coming up for you, and just really take time to pause and focus on you and, and call a friend if you need to. Next. All right. So before we go any further, we want to just define trauma just to make sure that we're all on the same page, but really talk about what trauma can look like in young children. And that could be looking like bullying, maybe losing a pet, um, losing a loved one, experiencing a natural disaster, um, neglect or abuse. But when we think about these things that young children experience, we all know that it's a disruption and really can result in trauma for them. Next. So here's some examples of different types of trauma. So when we look at extreme acute trauma, that can be like a devastating car accident or it can be a natural disaster like an earthquake or a hurricane or a tornado. But then we have chronic stressful events like poverty. That's very common. Or it could be domestic violence or even historical racism or systemic structures that impact us. But then we have something we call complex trauma. And that can very well start right at the beginning of the infant and toddler stage, right from our caregivers and family members. So we want to be, as we're journeying together, be mindful of the different types of trauma that we'll be navigating today. Next. So when we think about behavior, because we will be talking about today, we have to ask ourselves, why should we focus on young children and trauma? And so we know that it's important to talk about both, but also consider the context of the brain and how rapidly it develops, right? So as we navigate today, and we'll be talking about um, different things with the behavior and trauma, we want to make sure that trauma impacts that sensory input and the sensory output of young children. But we also know because the brain is developing so rapidly, it's going to reduce the size of the cortex that trauma is. So we want to be mindful of that when we're looking at behavior, we're looking at being more trauma attuned tuned and really understanding of what's happening in young children. Next. All right. So here are just some examples of when young children experience trauma. These are some of the things that they can have difficulty with. And recently, uh, Julia actually presented on revving up and we were talking about self-reg. But I want us to know that children don't know how to self-regulate. This is something that we have to teach and we have to also teach co-regulation, right? So you're going to find children that have difficulty with regulating their bodies. They're going to have a hard time staying focused following directions, even if it's one, two step directions. And then some children are going to be impulsive because remember we talked about the brain and how trauma impacts the brain. We don't know exactly what their story is, but we know it's going to show up in their behavior. It's also hard for children that have experienced trauma at a young age to develop friendships and maintain those friendships because we don't even know what space they're in and how safe they're feeling. Trusting is difficult and also secure attachments and relationships. So when we think about behavior, we think about what the behavior is telling us. We always want to think about 
hmm, I wonder what happened. And we're going to talk about that shift coming up too. Next. All right. And so, so when we think about trauma and we think about how that impacts our behavior, how does it really impact our self-esteem and how we feel about ourselves? So kind of pause and think about as adults, you know, our childhood and the things that we experienced, how did that carry over in our adult behavior? So think about as adults, all the spaces and the things that we're navigating because adulting can be a whole thing. Think about children and how they may feel where they're blaming themselves or they don't have the hope that as adults, we're working hard to have, right? Feeling helpless and even having a hard time saying positive things about themselves. Young children, right? So when we think about negative belief systems that we may have as adults, think about young children having these belief systems, but more importantly, where'd they come from? And what's where, where did it start? Where did it start? And then I want us to even start reflecting on when it started. What role can we play to help the, with the shift? Mm. Next. I love that so much because I think that we've both had experiences. And I'm curious for you all, if you would pop in the chat, where we're seeing kids at three, right? Kids who are just learning how to talk, already identifying and saying, I'm bad. I'm a bad boy or I'm a bad girl or um, what that might look like. And so really thinking about what you're saying, like, where did those messages come from? How have they already internalized them? They're 36 months old. So we have like cans in our pantries that are probably older than some of these children. And these are the big messages that are already being embedded. And then thinking about how that lives inside of them as they grow and develop into adolescence and adulthood. Um, and like you said, how do we really disrupt that? How do we support healing from that? And how are we showing up in a nurturing way around that? Mm. I love that question, Lisa, you have in the chat. Who told them that? Yes. Yeah. So we know that as we're thinking about young children and we're thinking about some of those experiences that they may have had that might rise to the level of trauma or it may have been extremely stressful for them that like Lisa said, it impacts all sorts of things, right? We know it's gonna show up in behavior. We know young children communicate messages through behavior and whether that's behavior that is developmentally appropriate that we expect and is just part of good old fashioned growing up Sometimes it's behavior that um, we might find challenging as adults. And sometimes it's behavior that is saying, I need some help learning a different way. I need a new skill to figure out how to do this in a different way. And I think the big piece is when we're thinking about this idea of trauma-informed care in the pyramid, we want to make sure that folks are aware that trauma and big experiences impact infants and young children. Our job isn't necessarily to get all the details and be trauma detectives and say, I need every single piece of the story. Our job is to really understand and hold and educate ourselves around how trauma does impact young children and their brain development and the signs and symptoms and how it might show up. But really to have these pieces built into our system, how are we thinking about having a system that is healing? Right. It's not enough just to say we're not going to re-traumatize kids. We want to go a step further. How are we going to say let's heal? And we also want to hold this idea that we're not going to talk about trauma without also talking about resilience and healing. Those go hand in hand because we know that a person is not their trauma. We know that. Right. And that's true for young children, too. And sometimes we can get so stuck in, but I don't know. I need to know. We know that you've all probably had experiences with young kids where you're saying, my gut is telling me something's off here. I might not ever have the details. That doesn't mean you can't still be an incredibly important important person to that child's healing or that family's healing or be one of those resilience or protective factors. So we also want to hold that as we're thinking about how trauma might show up, especially in young kids, it's important to hold that um, while trauma may be at play, there's a lot of other mental health pieces that could also be at play. So many symptoms of trauma might mirror things like ADHD or mirror things like autism or mirror things like anxiety or depression. And so we want to make sure we're holding that and that we're really thinking about, um, again, how are we looking through this trauma-informed lens to make sure that we're doing best by every single child, but especially those kids who may come to us who have experienced trauma. 
And as we think about moving into buffering the impacts of trauma, it's really important that we hold some of these factors in mind. So things like how old were they when it happened, right? When this experience happened, we know infants who don't have words yet might process trauma in a very different way. They're going to hold that experience in their body because they don't have words to communicate or show us or necessarily play through what their experience was. We know younger kids sometimes don't have that context. So they might think, oh my gosh, every time I get in the car, we're going to be in a car accident. And we know kids who are older, who have more experience, who have more context, who have more verbal capacity might um, process that experience in a different way too. So we want to think about that developmental age. We want to make sure that we're holding that trauma as a really individualized experience. So we might go through the same exact thing. Lisa and I might go through the same thing. And because of my history or her history, I might be like, you know what, Lisa, I can't get out of bed. I am scared. I have been rocked. I've been shaken and I don't want to go do that thing anymore because that really impacted me. Lisa might be like, yeah, it was really scary. It, it did not feel good. I was anxious about it, but I'm still able to get up and go and do my job or move through the world and life. And we need to hold that for kids too. I think sometimes as adults, we hear, well, I grew up or I had that same experience and I'm fine. And that might be very true for you as an adult, right? Or that person as an adult. It doesn't mean that that's necessarily that child or that family's experience. And we need to be thinking about all the factors that go into that. Um, we also need to be holding the type and the severity of the event, things like complex trauma, where there's not a clear start and end, where it's something that is happening within relationships that are supposed to be safe and trusting in those big nurturing pieces. We want to make sure that we're understanding that and holding that and recognizing that that prolonged duration of that stressful event or unpredictable event may show up differently than a one-time acute event. And that's not to say that one is worse than the other, but we want to make sure we're starting to understand some of those differences. And then, of course, we want to be looking at the big picture, right? What are those supports that this person has? What are the coping style? What is that child's temperament? How open is their family, right? Has their family been hurt and harmed by trauma or by systems? Are they open to supports? And we want to be thinking about overall, how can we make sure that when kids are in space with us, young children, that we're able to really think through a strength space lens and through a healing lens. So we know that everyone has a huge capacity, right, to heal. Um, and in early childhood, I know the word resilience, for especially for as we think about older kids and we think about adults, um, a lot of people have been steering away from using that word. Um, in the early childhood space, it's still pretty frequently used. And I think it's because we're really thinking about building that capacity through relationship. We know that young kids learn in the context of relationship. And so when we think about healing, when we think about building up that resilience, we're really thinking about how are we building up those skills? in that safe, nurturing relationship environment through that context, um, and that we're always holding young children's families in mind as we do this work. We're really holding and centering the culture in which they are living and growing, and we're honoring and respecting that as well. So just wanted to name that as we move forward here. So as we think a little bit deeper about those protective factors or those promotive factors, we can sort of break them into two pieces as we start to think about how are we incorporating healing into our policies, procedures, or practices, especially as it relates to working with young children. So we know we have assets. When we're thinking about assets, we're really holding that these are sort of those in internalized characteristics, right? Sometimes we, we're, we're sort of like, that's your temperament, right? You might come out and just be a little feisty, right? You might come out and be a little bit more on the sensitive side. There's no right or wrong, but being curious about that and understanding sort of um, where that temperament lies can help us to understand and think about how we are promoting the individualized strengths of every young child and family. Um, we can think a lot about that idea of what Lisa was saying around that internal concept and the impact that prolonged stress or trauma has on that internal concept as it relates to self-esteem. So we know there's kids who come to us and they already are saying, people don't like me. I'm bad. I'm not lovable, right? And whether they're, they're saying that through their words or they're showing us that through their behavior, that is the message that we're giving. And so how are we helping to rewire the brain to say, you are good. 
you are capable, you are loved, you are likable, right? We know that sometimes we see this idea of um, these assets or these internal skills that are being built really intersect with these positive factors. Like who are those really important relationships in that young child and that family's life? We know that things like being able to build social skills is huge. And we know that early childhood is one of the best places to do it because one, we have time to do it. And two, people are intentionally building that in across the day. And as Lisa talks about the pyramid model, we really want to highlight the importance of those social skills as a protective factor. Um, we also really want to be thinking about communities. We want to be thinking about safe environments. We want to be thinking about being culturally responsive and making sure that we have adults and youth programs and peers that are there to really uplift the culture and community and environments that our young children are living in and making sure that um, we're being responsive to that and that those places feel safe and supportive. So as we sort of think about trauma-informed care here, um, this image comes from our friends at Lori um, out of Chicago, um, the Lori Center. And they sort of have made this nice infographic for us. Um, and so it's kind of, we call it the hamburger, right? It kind of looks like a hamburger, but basically what we're saying is, um, there's a lot of different factors that go into trauma-informed care, and there's a little bit of debate around like which one should be included or highlighted the most, but there's big consensus that these three middle, sort of the meat of our hamburger, the, the middle part, right, these creating safe environments, this idea that relationships are paramount to everything we do, relationships and connectedness. And that doesn't just mean with kids, that means with their families too. That means with adults who might be sharing space. So as we think about early education and care, if Lisa and I are co-teachers, we need to have a relationship, right? If we're stressed and we don't really like each other and it's hard for us to work together, guess what? Our little friends in that classroom are inhaling all of that stress. And that's what they're seeing modeled. Oh, these adults don't like each other. Oh, they gave each other a dirty look, right? How are we really thinking about how relationships are integrated across full systems? And then we also need to be thinking about how are we teaching emotional regulation and regulation skills? We know that idea of problem solving, how to share, how to wait, behavior impulse control, emotional impulse control. What do I do when I'm angry? What do I do when I'm sad? What do I do when I feel like I just want to hit someone, right? We know that oftentimes those skills aren't as intentionally taught as, as we would like them to be. And especially for kids who've experienced trauma, their brain flips into that place where they're in fight, flight, or freeze. And so they are usually going to show us a behavior that is either saying, let me protect myself. And that might be by fighting or doing an externalized behavior, or let me escape or elope or get out of here. Let me run away, right? Our flight, let me move or our freeze. Let me withdraw. And we know that all those behaviors really come back to the importance of teaching that emotional regulation and that behavioral regulation. And then we think about how do we encompass all of this? In order to do this really important work, we need to be thinking about one, how are we holding and understanding culture and equity as we talk about this? So things like systemic racism, things like disproportionality, we have to be embedding that in everything we do. And we also have to be thinking about how well are the people who are doing this work? So if you're part of a system, what is your self-care like? What does your own wellness look like? How is that built into this? Because if we as adults are not well, we are not going to be able to show up in relationship with young children. And like Lisa said, our young children need us to be there to co-regulate. They need to inhale some of our regulation or our calm or our ability to make sure that we have enough energy for the task at hand. And if we're not showing up that way, then they're not going to be learning that. Wow. Thank you, Julia. I mean, I'm going to pause and just go back to some of the things you uplifted. You talked about relationships, culture and equity and staff wellness, because the work starts with us, right? So we show up every day in our programs, you know, in our positions, but 
we have to start our own self-regulation first so that we can do the work and build in relationships and really honor culture from an equitable lens. But you said something about we may have the same experience, but you may be fine or I may not be fine right? That we need to hold on to different types of trauma because they show up different. That's exactly what this space is about today. Holding on to that because it looks different in each child and family. And so when we look at this diagram, right, we're focusing today on the individual, family, and community factors that contribute to children developing mental health problems. But more importantly, we encourage you that when you hear the word trauma, think about it more broadly in terms of systemically. Think about how equity, racism, our history, our political history, systems and structures can all influence or just be a factor related to trauma. So we want to hold on to this in the context of relationships and connecting with the children and families that we serve. Thank you, Julia. Next. I love that, Lisa. Thank you for uplifting that. We love to borrow from our friends, y'all. So this slide comes from our friends at UCSF, University of um, Cal of Sa <laughs> sorry, uh, University of California, San Francisco. Um, and anyone who's familiar with child parent psychotherapy, this is coming out of that same lab. Our good friends. Um, have shared this sort of visual of how we can think about um, where we might be landing either as a system, or you could even think about this as sort of more down to an individual relational level too. And so you can see over on the left, we have trauma reactive. And as you look at sort of um, the description of that, that idea of things feel really fragmented, it doesn't feel safe, either emotionally safe, that might mean we don't feel like we can speak up and say, I'm worried about this thing because we're scared there might be repercussions. It might mean that like actually physically, we don't really feel safe in our environment. It might mean we don't have that relational underpinning to be able to have that connection to take risks or have brave conversations. Um, oftentimes, it's like this overwhelming feel of just overwhelm right? Like we are here and we can never be preventative because we're just constantly putting fires out. Like, oh, let me go do that thing. Let me do that. We're in a very reactive state. So we never get to slow down and actually think, what could I do to plan to make sure that this thing isn't happening? Because we're just constantly trying to go, go, go react to what is happening to us. And oftentimes this can end up being like we're in a fear driven state. So I'm just responding because I don't want anyone to get hurt. So let me respond. Let me respond. Let me respond. Or we start to numb out and we're like, hey, this is just the way it is. We go into that freeze place where we're like, mm, I'm here. My body's here, but I'm not genuinely connecting. I'm not in relationship. I'm not really here inside i'm a little numb i'm somewhere else i'm disassociated right and so we know this can be true for systems and then this can also be true down to that sort of relational level too so i want you to think about like where you are in your space and that might be individually or where you work are you in this trauma reactive space have you been in this this is curious we're not being judgmental here but you can pop in the chat if you feel comfortable or just take a second to reflect on that we then think about, um, oftentimes we then are like, okay, well, let's get trauma informed. If we get trauma informed, that's going to help us like not be trauma reactive, right? And so as we think about trauma informed, we, we hold our four R's, which we're going to talk about in a second, but we're really thinking about how um, are we recognizing and realizing that trauma is widespread for young children and their families and our systems? How are we really thinking about um, recognizing the effects, the signs and symptoms and impacts that trauma might have on our system, but also on our individual families and children and staff? And then we think about how do we respond in a way that is going to be supportive and strengths-based and healing. And then the big part is we're like, let's not re-traumatize anyone, right? Like let's resist re-traumatization. So are our policies and our procedures, is that all baked into a place where we're saying we're going to resist this traumatization? So sometimes we get to the place and we're like, great, we're trauma-informed. We stop there. And we're here to say, we want you to go another step. We know that it is so important to be trauma informed in order to combat that trauma reactive place, but we want to go a little bit further. We want to say, let's be safe, let's be supportive, and let's be a healing and attuned 
system, program, relationship, a place where we literally are able to do that relational based work with young children and their families to make a, a difference. And maybe that's your system. We know we have families coming in who have been harmed by systems in the past. And when we think about a safe, supportive, healing and attuned system, sometimes that's like a breath of fresh air for a family. They're like, whoa, you just named that or you're thinking about that or I can see myself and I feel like I belong here. That's amazing. So we want to be thinking about how do we get to this place where the system feels integrated, where it feels like we actually have the time and space and capacity to practice reflection and use it to deeper understand our own behaviors, to understand what might be happening around us. How are we making sure that we're relationally centered? How are we in connection with other people? How are we thinking about that growth mindset and being preventative first and foremost, instead of feeling like we're constantly in this reactive state? And then we know that as we do this, that op offers opportunities to be flexible. We're able to adapt more readily. The trust is there. The relationship is there. And that means that we're going to be more equitable and inclusive because we can adapt, because we can say, hey, we need to shift this. We need to do it in a different way. And so when we think about that safe and supportive and healing, we're really thinking about what parts of ourself or our system might already be there and what are some places we might want to be more intentional and we also know that this isn't a linear path like we can't just check box like oh we were trauma reactive and then we got trauma informed and now we're safe and healing because we know all it takes is one event and we might be right back into that trauma reactive place and so this is another opportunity to use that reflection to say where are we right now where are we and where do we want to go and how are we going to get there, right? Sometimes even just a little plan like that can be our first steps to start to say, huh, we can make a difference. We can move into that safe and supportive and healing place, um, but we need a little time and space to reflect on it and think about how we do it. Wow, Juliet. Now, you, you come with some nuggets today, some nuggets and some wisdom, and I love it because... I heard you say, let's go as another step. Let's go a step further from just being um, having the trauma informed care lens. But how do we hold a safe and supportive stance? That's what I heard you say. And I also heard you say, what about us anchoring from a, having a relationally centered approach? Right. I mean, and then the, what really like touched me. And I felt that you said we're one event away from a traumatic experience. Literally, that's all it takes to offset us. So knowing that life lies and things happen, the chat is booming. I love the conversation in the chat. I want us to just hold on to these things that Julia shared with us and realize the humanness that we all share today in this space, right? But let's take it a step further and hold that safe, supportive stance. But right now, we want to talk about glowing and growing. And so in the chat, we want to hear what are some things in your workplace, what are ways that you're responding to trauma? And also, let's say if your program is emerging, what are some things that we can grow into? So what are some things that we're doing really well in terms of adopting a trauma-informed care lens, but taking it further? And what are some things that, you know, we want to shine and share? So we want to take a second or so, a couple, maybe a minute or so, Julia, and see if yeah. folks want to share in the chat. I'm just catching, yeah, Lisa, and I'm just catching up in the Q&A and there are some great questions in here and we definitely have resources to share with you all for young children. Um, mm -hmm. And I think just having some conversations like this are so important because we know that we intersect with young children no matter the type mm -hmm. of work we do. I might say I only work with adults. Well, guess what? You're probably working with a parent, right? They probably have a young mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. I only work with adolescents. Well, do they have a younger sibling? they were young at one point, right? And so being able to hold this lens of early childhood experiences, I think is so important. Um, and I think so hopeful, Lisa, because we have such an opportunity to make such a huge difference when we mm -hmm. have this information and we can intervene early. And it doesn't just have to be in a clinical way, right? We can mm -hmm. think about our communities and how we're mm -hmm. uplifting young children and their experiences and their families. 
Yeah, and I see um, some feedback here and some insight about behavior and disconnecting, unwillingness to change. And I tell you from my lived experiences, I've always been a part of education, but I've always been a parent too. And it's tough when you're that parent and you have the kid that nobody wants, you're getting the calls every day, the report outs every day, you're fearing that your child's gonna get kicked out of preschool. It is very tough. So that may show up as they're unwilling, that they're unable, they don't want to, but I just really encourage you all to show the family's grace, right? And give them time to process. Because when I found out that my son was different and that he was diagnosed with ADHD, it was a gut punch. And I'm Mm. just being very honest. So I'm a part of the education system that almost thrusted him out because of his neurodiversity. So it it may appear that they don't care. It may appear that some families just don't, but they may not even have the bandwidth, right? So we go back to defining different levels of trauma, what that looks like in young children. It's the same thing for adults. And in the chat, I just appreciate the vulnerability share. Folks are sharing about their own things that they're regulating through. And that's the, the beauty of us all being human. It's the beauty of us all saying, hey, we're doing the work in the field, in our own lives. And so we just encourage you to think of when we think of the families that we serve from that relational context Julia talked about, right? Are our systems and structures equitable? Do we see certain families in different lights? Do they rub us the wrong way? So we're already presuming that the kid is going to misbehave. You know, do we have an attitude when the family shows up? Because like, here we go. They don't care. You know, Timmy's doing the same thing every day and mom doesn't care. Mom does care. She just may not know how to respond in the way that we think she responds. And that can be a whole power thing, right? But I say from lived experience, I encourage all folks on the line just to show our families grace and figure out a way to revisit the context of the relationships of the families you serve and say, is there a way to repair? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to build trust with this family? Is there a way to reconnect with this family in a way that when I call them, it's more from a supportive space instead of me saying, oh, they did it again. Moonwalking on the table, spitting, hitting. I knew it was going to happen. Is there a way that we can look at the landing of the message? How is that delivery? And so I just wanted to uplift that as I read through some of the comments. I just appreciate all the feedback y'all are sharing. Mm. Lisa, I love that so much. And I think about those families that you're talking about where we hear those comments like, oh, why can't they just why can't they just show up in a different way? Why can't mm-hmm. they just do this thing? They don't care, right? Mm-hmm. And I think um that's another really important place to stop and get curious. Like when we find ourselves judging and we all do it, right? We all have judgments, some of us more than others, mm-hmm. right? Based on experiences, based on our own well-being, um mm-hmm. and where we are in time and space and our own histories. How do we stop and say, "Wow, I hear myself really judging? How can I get curious? How do I flip that? How do I say, I wonder what else is going on for this family? What else is happening for them right now that is making it hard for them to be in relationship in the way that I would hope they'd be showing up about this topic? Because it could be, you know what? I just had to truck across the city on six different buses to be able to get to the food pantry to feed my family tonight. So guess what? Lisa jumping up and down on the table is not my top priority right? Or I can't show up to that meeting or it's a great piece of art, but we got to go make that bus stop or we're in a, a, you know, in an environment where there's community violence and my baby's not going to be standing on the corner where there could be active things happening. That's not me being a safe parent. And so I think sometimes that idea of giving grace helps us to deepen that curiosity and really seek to understand what else might be happening. And that's when we get those deeper relationships and actually move into partnership with family, which I think is so important as we talk about young children. Absolutely. And thank you, Julie, just for uplifting those things, especially the bus scenario. We have teachers catching a bus to work, Mm. right? And so imagine (laughs) having to show up after you've had to catch two buses to work and to show up in spaces like that. So we have folks that live in the same communities that they serve. And we got to be mindful of that, too, when we just talk about our own regulation, our own nervous systems and our own relational context. What does that look like? So, yes, moving to the partnership frame. All right. Perfect. Okay, so we just appreciate the comments in the chat and we're going to just keep on pushing through. 
Mm -hmm. So as we move into Lisa really um, getting into our meat around the pyramid model, which we are, we're both pyramid model girlies, right, Lisa? We like it. We're here. We're like promoters of it. <laughs> we believe in it. Um, we want to hold these four R's of our trauma-informed care. So we really want to think about that realization that um, trauma impacts communities, it impacts systems, it impacts individuals, it impacts young children and their families and those who are in relationship with them. We want to recognize those signs and symptoms because again, like Lisa said, it can look different for young kids. It could look like a behavior and we're not looking back and saying, wow, actually this is a trauma response or a symptom. Um, we want to make sure that we are responding to trauma in ways that we know are developmentally appropriate so that we're making sure that we're giving those skills, that we're building up those skills, that we're supporting that healing. And of course, we want to make sure that we're resisting that re-traumatization. And when we're able to do this, we're able to move into that safe and supportive healing place. Thank you so much, Julie. I appreciate that. And so if we can see by a show of hearts, who's familiar with the pyramid model? Who's ever heard of the pyramid model? If your programs have adopted it, your states. Okay, we got pyramid love in the room. Very good. And so like Julie said, we're pyramid girlies. We really are. We love the pyramid model. And so one thing that we talk about is how do we really institute this work from a trauma-informed and equitable lens? combined. And so we won't go heavy to unpacking, but we do want to look at some of the things here on the slide that kind of pop out. And so for the folks that do know about the pyramid model, that effective workforce, or if you don't know, that's us. That's us at the summit right now going to conferences. And that's us saying that we're here to do the work. But not only are we here to do the work to expand our thinking, our systems, our policies, but we're also here to say, hey, we believe in this. We believe in becoming more trauma attuned. So before we go any further, we want to meet our families where they're at from this lens. Then we look at the blue portion of the pyramid model and we call that tier one. This is where we're doing, we're really fostering these nurturing and these safe, responsive relationships right at intake, right at enrollment. But then we also look at high quality supportive environments. And in that area, this is where we look at predictability. Does everyone know exactly what they're supposed to be doing? Are the schedules and routines posted and clear? Are we teaching about emotions? And not only that, are we honoring and implementing the home language in everything that we do? When I walk in the classroom, do the families look like me? When I look at the library, when I look at the baby dolls, do they look like me? Right? So that's what we consider high quality supportive environments. So even when we have all these systems in place, it's some children that need a targeted supports. So we look at the green section of the pyramid model. We call that tier two. And this is where we say we have universal practices in place for all children. We have predictability. We have relationships. The effective workforce is brought in. But some children need a little bit more support around problem solving, friendship skills, expressing themselves, co-regulation. So we focus on that in this green portion. But then when the, some of these children, when they get these supports, it's still some at the very top of the pyramid that may be supported under IDEA, the Individual Disability Education Act. And some of these children at the top of the pyramid, right, they have chronic behavior needs. So when we look at the pyramid model and really addressing trauma, we wanna maintain that supportive stance. We wanna maintain the trauma-informed lens, but also look at prevention and promotion. How do we teach them skills? How are we teaching about social emotional skills? And, and to take it even further, how do we keep them in our program? How do we not remove them out of the class because that's a soft suspension? How do we avoid calling the parents every day when now we're pushing them out the program because now the parents are overwhelmed and they got to leave work to pick them up, right? So when we look at the pyramid model from a trauma-informed lens and it's truly equitable, we're keeping kids in the program. We're getting relationships started right at the effective workforce. We're saying we're here to do the work. Right. And so before we get to a checklist, like Julia mentioned before, do we even have a relationship with the family? Why are we collecting BIRs on the child and we don't even know who the family, who they are? Right. And so it's time for us to really pause and just and this isn't anything bad, but just look at ourselves and how we're showing up in the work. Right. So we advocate. We love the pyramid model, but we also want to move to this healing space and move to this supportive stance. All right, next. 
All right. Very good. So we kind of talked about moving and shifting the old way, looking at the pyramid model. We want to focus on, oh, we got to fix this behavior and let's get our checklist and do all these things. But how do we look at skill building and healing? And you can't do any of that without that relationship, that nurturing and responsive relationship. Right. How do we become more trauma informed, trauma attuned, meaning aware of what's happening? Our teachers are catching buses. The families are catching buses. We might have food insecurities at the top of the list. So you think that my child's going to sit in circle time and they're hungry or the lights are off or there's domestic violence in the home. So we want to move to a healing space. And, and the pyramid model is not a quick fix. Quick fix. It's a process. It's a cyclical process that starts relationally. It starts with us, the effective workforce, saying we're ready. We're committed. We're here to do the work. And it's going to be tough because we have to be vulnerable to do this work, but we're here and we're going to show up with compassion, right? And we're going to give ourselves grace and the family's grace. And so we just want to show you this crosswalk and really stay in the space of shifting the way we've been doing things and the way that we want to continue to do things going forward. Next. All right. And so when we look at how to support young children, this, I love this infographic because it really shows it starts with the relationships, right? Those safe, secure attachments, right? Feeling safe, the predictability, knowing exactly what we got going on today. Because you know what? It makes me feel safe. At home, I don't know what's happening. I don't know where I'm going to lay my head. We're transient. I don't know where my next meal is coming from. So I need routine. I need predictability. That makes me feel safe. And then because I'm dysregulated, I need somebody to teach me how to express myself. Or if you want to hug, I need to know what that feels like because I may not like to be touched because of whatever happened in my foster home. So when we look at supporting young children in the work that we do in early childhood education, we really want to look at these healthy relationships that are anchored in security, anchored in safety, routine that's predictable, and also the emotional piece. Going beyond how are you feeling today, but what made you feel that way? Next. All right. So here are just some trauma-informed practices that we want to make sure that, and we've kind of already talked about these things today, but we just want you all to have it. We have a lot of great input in the chat about sharing resources and sharing our information. But one thing that really stands out to me when I think of the trauma-informed practices is having a posture of support. And support is this huge umbrella of partnership. It's a huge umbrella of making the families feel like experts. It's a huge umbrella that has empathy, understanding, grace, right? Humility, vulnerability, transparency, a posture of support where we're shifting from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. How can I help you? How can I fill in the gap? How can I bring safety and security in this moment? Next. You're muted, Julia. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we know that when we think about what Lisa just um, laid out there, and I was just looking through the Q&A, and there's a lot of questions like, how do we help families understand that their child may have experienced trauma? That, And we know families sometimes don't want to think that because oftentimes for young children who've experienced trauma, it's been in the context of these really important relationships that have that can really harm but can really heal too. And so I think we need to hold and think about the, those relationships that sometimes there may be missteps or there may be things out of our control or there may be things where we were part of the harming, but we can be part of the healing too. And so I think as we think about that, I want to uplift the importance of really starting early with young kids. Um, because when we look at the brain, we have such a unique opportunity in this age range, this sort of zero to six age range, where the brain is taking every single thing in. And so if we have repeated experiences that are really stressful and traumatic and scary, that's what our brain and our neurosynaptic connections are going to hold those big pathways, right? It's going to be the big, scary pathways. But through those repeated experiences of um, having safety and predictability, having those really important nurturing safe relationships, having friends, learning skills like how to share and how to wait and how to ask for help and how to say, I'm angry 
I'm sad. I'm disappointed. I'm jealous. Our emotional literacy, we can see how when we start to learn those early on, that's going to help us in our teen years as a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 14-year-old to be able to say, I'm upset. I'm angry. And I know what that feels like in my body and I can say it, right? And we know that the more repeated positive experiences we have a unique opportunity to literally rewire the brain at this age where we can make those pathways of repeated positive experience the big pathways, the deep pathways, the pathways that don't get pruned away. And so as we think about um, trauma in early child and we think about the importance of frameworks like the pyramid model that uplift and promote social emotional competencies through a cultural res culturally responsive lens through things like trauma informed care um, we can think about those repeated experiences and how important it is that we have families that we have caregivers that we have educators that we have therapists who are thinking about how do we make sure that we're uplifting that that's where the healing comes in that's how the brain is able to change and shift and that's how we're able to have something really hard happened to us early on and not necessarily have the repercussions from it at 13, 14, 15, 25, 40, 50, 60, and beyond. So this is just a little activity you all can take back with you. I think you have our slides as a PDF, um, but this is just a little perspective activity. When we think about um, being trauma informed, sometimes we might have to give up some things. Sometimes we might be stuck in an old way of doing things or a very traditional way of doing things. And so these are some questions we can ask ourselves and you can think about um, shifting these little to ask families that you might work with or parents that you might work with too. Um, and so an example of that would be um, adults believe that difficult behaviors are, pers are personal and purposeful. So like they do this on purpose. They're pushing my buttons on purpose. Well, they know that makes me angry. And so they do it, right? We know, I'm sure many of us have heard that. Maybe some of us were raised that way, hearing that. And so as we think about the trauma-informed way, we'd be shifting to say, I understand that um, difficult behaviors might come up because you're in fight, flight, or freeze, because you are experiencing stress right now and your body doesn't know a different way to let me know you're stressed. You're showing me, you're communicating through your behavior. When I understand that, I'm not taking it personally. I'm showing up as someone who wants to help regulate you, who wants to help be in relationship with you and wants to heal. And so you can think about how we sort of slowly start to make these shifts. And these can even be used as ports of entry with families too, to sort of start to think about how were you raised? What were your experiences? What were your family's values and culture systems? And how do you want it to look for your child? What did you like about that? And what do you wanna leave? from that. And we know in our family systems, we all have things that we want to uphold and are an important part of our life and our culture and um, our traditions. And I'm sure most people have some things that they're like, I would like to leave that one behind. That's not something I want to pass on to my child or to future generations. And so how do we have those conversations and think about that? This is something that can help us do that. Thank you so much, Julia, for just uplifting that. And so we want to go ahead and get ready to go to our Q&A. So we're going to just advance through the next okay. slide. But we want you to know people are so much more than the trauma they experience. And Julia said this right at the beginning. We're all one event away from a traumatic experience. You never know. And so we're more than that. We are more than that. We want to hold that. We want to just continue to be supportive um, and just carry this forward. Next. Mm -hmm. We're going to power through some really great resources that we have. So NCPMI, for folks that do not know, Julia, she's done a great job sharing the information. That's the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. And so it's tons of information on the pyramid model and also trauma-informed care practices. So you have it in our PowerPoint and also you can scan the QR code as we advance through. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton Another of- Another good checklist. Yep. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, there's a ton of really great no, resources- ahead, in there for families too. So I've seen that come up in the Q&A quite a bit. Like there are ready to go printed evidence-based resources for families down to how do you create a daily schedule? How do you set um, rules for your house, right? Do you have rules? Like, guess what? Your young children aren't gonna know what to do if you're not communicating those clearly. So there's a lot of really great activities. How do you create a calming space in your house? How do we have understanding for families around, my child seems really angry. What do I do with that? So we know there's a ton of great resources for families in there, as well as therapists, 
teachers, early education systems. I really feel like there's something for everyone. Policymakers, there's some great information. And there's these modules that you can go through that are completely free. So if you want to learn more about the pyramid model, you have the access to all of that information too um, with notes, slides. And so it's a great way to be able to strengthen how you're thinking about social emotional development and trauma-informed care for young children. Perfect. Thank you, Julia. And I love how you talked about the family piece, but also bringing these exercises back to staff. That's important, too. I heard some folks in the chat say, what if I have staff that don't believe in this? Right. And so it's a lot of guiding questions and different exercises like the hot button activity that can take you can take that back for state leaders, take it to programs, regions, territories and use it as a reflection tool. And so when we look at an intention, we want you all to set one intention. How are we going to carry this work forward? that's going to impact our children, families, and the folks that's doing the work in community. So I want you to take a second because we're going to hop over to Q&A. We got five minutes left, but think about one thing we're going to do intentionally and that one strategy that we can use that's going to support resilience and healing. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at the Q&A now, Lisa. Um, I think like anyone looking for resources, check out um, thechallengingbehaviors.org. There's a lot of great resources. And also the ECLKC. This is the Head Start Hub for um, mm -hmm. for like all their resources. There's a whole section there on early childhood mental health all about trauma-informed care. There's tip sheets on how do we talk about grief with young children? How do we talk about transition? How do we talk about incarceration? How do we talk about um, a wide variety of topics? And then there's a great suite on staff wellness too. So if you're thinking about well-being and you're thinking about whether it's people who work with young children um, or others, this can be a great resource too, where again, things are ready to go. You can print and go. Lisa and I are all about like, I want something to take back to my program this afternoon, tomorrow, right? Like that's where we live too. And so definitely check those out. Oh, and Karina just mentioned Sesame Street Online. Sesame in communities mm -hmm. has a ton of resources for young children. They're one of our partners that we work with. They've got great videos. They have videos on talking about therapy with kids. They have videos about loss. They have videos about um, substance use or exposure, um, all sorts of different topics. Yes. Thank you for that, Julie. I was trying to find some stuff from eClick to link over, but I know we have a few minutes left. Somebody mentioned, how do I connect with grandparents or other family mm -hmm. members? Um, that are actively involved or the caregiver of a young child. It goes back to that relational stance, right? So the times have changed. We have grandparents raising children. We have uncles, aunts. We have children in foster care. Home life looks very different. And this is really, this is our normal. And so I think it's up to us adapting to this. But how do we build that relationship with the grandparent? How do we take this information and simplify it in a way because there are, we have to honor those belief systems and how folks were raised. And Julia talked about that. How do we take this information and carry it over in a way where it's very uh, meaningful, right? And that we also honor the grandparent stance when we bring this information. And I think that's something to hold on and reflect on. How can I unpack this information so it's not so heavy? I'm not dumping it, but maybe one thing to focus on at a time so that the grandparent still feels like there's trust and support in that relational dynamic. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Lisa Knight and uh, Julia uh, Sales. I'm afraid we're we're kind of at the time and um, love all uh, the questions. And I think uh, Julia and Lisa have been able to answer some um, as we have gone along in, in the presentation. For the PowerPoint, you can find that in the resources button. It looks like two sheets of paper that um, should be on your screen and you can um, access the PowerPoint there. Um, so again, I wanna thank Lisa and Julia for the, sharing their time, experience um, and expertise with us today. I know I've learned so much um, and thank you um, to all of you who have attended and asked 
great questions and um, and have participated. Um, our next session begins in 30 minutes. Um, and for those of you interested in, in early childhood, this may be of interest. Um, we'll hear from keynote speaker, um, I think it's Lindsay Amir, um, who will illuminate the intersection of early childhood education and gender identity, uh, drawing from their book, Rainbow Parenting for LGBTQ plus youth, highlighting the life-saving impact of acceptance. I also ask that you please complete your summit survey on the reception page at the end of the day. We appreciate this feedback. I think a lot of your questions will be used to maybe help develop some additional resources or think about um, additional activities. Um, and as a reminder, um, please complete um, your survey um, to request continuing education uh, credits. And with that, thank you so much. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, guys.